Hello and welcome to News Click. In yet another incident of army firing in Kashmir, six people lost their lives on Sunday in Shopian. This incident again has a lot of problematic aspects as the narrative given by the army and the accounts given by the locals have a lot of differences. To discuss this incident and to discuss the, this government's policy towards Kashmir in general, we have with us today Gautam Navlakha, who is a democratic rights activist. So Gautam, welcome to News Click. Six people lost their lives, as you know. And while the army named four of, two of them were militants and the army called the other four as overground workers, but the locals have called them as civilians and even the chief minister of Kashmir, Mahmoud Mufti, called them civilians. So what is this difference between civilians and overground workers? What do you think about this? Well, an overground worker is, uh, is a notion that has been promoted by the armed forces in Kashmir around uh, in the in, uh, after in the millennium, you know, 21st century, as a way of uh, claiming that there are civilians who are hand in gloves with the uh, armed militants, and therefore they are uh, at par with uh, the militants themselves, despite the fact that they, they remain unarmed. This uh, is something that the army, uh, armed forces have been claiming, and uh, if you recall the statement of the army chief last year, when uh, soon after he took over charge mm -hmm. as uh, superseding two generals, so was senior to him, uh, bypassing two generals, uh, he had said that we will be going after the overground workers. Mm -hmm. So this tussle between this designating uh, civilians and passing them, passing killings of civilians as killings of overground worker is in fact a way of trying to justify mm -hmm. uh, uh, killing of, of, of civilians uh, at one level. But let's look a little closely at the two incidents that have taken place in Shompia, the Govanpura, Govanpura incident from January 27th in which uh, three civilians were killed and this particular, particular incident from Panu this sun last Sunday in which four civilians uh, were killed. Let's look at the sequence of events I'll, uh, because it will help explain what the problem is. Now, the army had claimed that they, in the, the, that you know, they had taken out uh, while they were going passing to the Gowanpura village. Uh, they came under stone pelters, and uh, uh, their personnel were injured. Vehicles were damaged. One of the JCOs, junior commission officer, was on the verge of being lynched. Therefore, they opened fire and killed it. Now, when the but it, from the subsequent events, it, I mean information that has come out and uh, information that has also come out in the me print media, it makes it very clear that they the civilians, the villagers contest this version of the army story. They point out in the army in the morning there was a, a, a army convoy which passed through the uh, through that village. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a, a tussle with the locals over some posters and banners and bun the buntings that had been put up to commemorate the death of uh, some civilians, including a local uh, boy who was a militant. Uh, and that in the evening around 3, quarter past 3, another convoy of the army, despite the fact uh, that one had already passed through and encountered this, uh, the, you know, there was this tussle, uh, they decided to once again make their way through the same uh, village. It's whereupon they came under attacks. Now, the villagers point out a couple of things. They said that in the first place, how is it possible for an armed convoy, uh, as JCO, mm -hmm. to be picked out from a vehicle, an armored carrier vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, by the villagers if they wanted to even lynch him? That even if there was a desire, where was it possible? How was it possible for them to drag out? They, I mean, the soldiers would have opened fire uh, right there and then mm -hmm. uh, to kill. Had that been uh, the case, Subsequent information that has been brought out in Indian Express by Muzamil Jalil points out that despite repeated reminders, the army has refused to, to uh, cooperate with the police in their investigations. So therefore, when the police ask them for a list of names of the injured soldiers, uh, the, the, they wanted to look at uh, the vehicles that had been damaged. Uh, they wanted to know what kind of weapons were used and the, and the ammunition that was employed, how many rounds were fired, etc. Routine police inquiry. The, the stock reply from the army was that the matter is being uh, 
uh, looked into and therefore verified and therefore uh, they, they refused to response. cooperate with the police. Now in the second incident if you come to Panu, hmm. so there are there are a lot of questions about the first incident and itself. And also uh, Mahmoobah Mufti had said in the assembly that the police had told the army, had given the army a warning to not right. pass through the area. Yes, in fact there was a police advisory uh, Mahmoobah Mufti pointed out in the assembly, floor of the assembly on January 29 which said that the, despite the advisory of the police, the army refused to, uh, to abide by that and decided to go through it although they had been warned that things can, you know, flare up. In the second incident, if you look at it, the army statements have been uh, improved, improving over a period. The first statement only claimed that the one so-called terrorist had been killed when it, they defied uh, the orders of a mobile uh, uh, checkpoint uh, to, to stop. Uh, that the terrorists opened fire, the army had to retaliate and in which this terrorist died. Subsequently, they added that three more people, overground workers, were traveling with that uh, militant who was killed uh, in the same vehicle. Subsequent information came out that actually the civilians were found in a second vehicle hmm. and they had carried no weapons, there was nothing incriminating found upon them. Hmm. Lo and behold, on a day later, a third vehicle is discovered with another civilian, unarmed, also dead. And a body of a militant hmm. who must have run away from the so-called encounter site hmm. was found several kilometers away in an orchard. Hmm. The point is, all these things make it very clear that there is a need for investigation. an investigation and a fair investigation, mm. which the army has contested and they went, I mean, the father of, the, of a serving officer, mm. uh, which is uh, unprecedented, has gone to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court willy-nilly, without even looking into it, fallen prey to the media build-up and the pressure that was built up outside and have accepted the petition. Yeah, so before we go to that, I would like to find, point out that in the... Uh, Sunday's incident, as you were saying, the third car, which was discovered 10 kilometers away. The father of the civilian who died also pointed out that the, uh, his son's body was in the car while there was no blood in the car. And also there was a bullet in, in the back, but there was no bullet in the, ba in the, in the car's seat. So again, that raises a lot of questions. That he was shot from the back, it's yeah. very clear, from the wound mark. Uh, so yeah, of course, that shows the need for an investigation. As you said, now the Supreme Court has stayed investigation in the previous case of Chopin. Now, the interesting thing here about FIRs is why is it the army so makes such a hue and cry about even registering of an FIR? Mm -hmm. Now, let me trace back in 1992 April, mm -hmm. uh, when Jammu and Kashmir was under governor's rule, the executive order was issued asking all the police stations in Jammu and Kashmir not to register any FIR mentioning naming mm -hmm. any armed forces personnel. This had to be withdrawn in 1992, meeting objections from, from, the, from the lawyers, bar association and other, uh, from, the lo from the local judiciary. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems that the same demand which had been rejected and withdrawn in 1992 has come back and in fact with greater force as a, as a, as a consequence of an orchestrated campaign backed now this time by the judiciary yeah. uh, to, to ensure that uh, this, the, this you know, becomes a legal. So, I mean, the legal immunity enjoyed by the soldiers fighting uh, in armed conflict at home against our own people, yeah. uh, they will be not be, even if a civilian is injured, killed, uh, molested, uh, sexual violence is uh, per, you know, perpetrated against them, uh, that no FIR will be recorded against them without hmm. the sanction of the centre. Yeah, now there has been an affidavit by the centre and they've said that there has to be a total bar on the Jammu and Kashmir government registering any FIR or instituting criminal proceedings in, the sh in, uh, in this case or in any other case. Which, I mean, what does that s uh, say about this government's policy towards Kashmir? I mean, the army has had legal immunity in the past, of course, in all these conflicted areas. Mm -hmm. But this government stance seems to be particularly uh, harder towards the civilians of Kashmir and of course in, like, in sort of shielding the army. 
You're very correct because even in the case of Manipur, when the matter came before the two judge bench of Justice Lot Lokur and uh, Lalit, uh, Mukul Rohodgi, who was the Attorney General, had made the same plea and said that no FIR can be registered even in, in whatever is done in the course of a duty. So this seems to be the policy of the government, which, what, which is what the present, the new Attorney General has reiterated before the Supreme Court. Now there are a couple of interesting points here. Um, in a constitutional bench judgment in November 2013, Lalita Kumar, Kumari versus State of UP, it's a constitutional bench, five judge bench, mm -hmm. superior to the three judge bench looking into this Shopian incident, had made it very clear, complaint about regarding any cognizable offense shall be recorded. They have said that it's mandatory. Mm -hmm. The police cannot refuse to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, are we entering a period mm -hmm. where there be a two glass system, meaning that there would be one law for the civilian and another law for government uh, officers and especially the, the government soldiers. It's extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm. A, you are already deploying an army which is trained in a very different way to fight an external enemy mm -hmm. against our own people. You try, if you provide them the same legal immunity which obviously soldiers require when they're fighting, uh, 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 defending the borders, uh, does not apply because you are here confronted with a situation where the army is being deployed against your own people. Mm. So the same jurisdiction, criminal court's jurisdiction ought to apply mm. in order to ensure that army doesn't start acting with impunity and create, uh, commit atrocities yeah. and, war, uh, and crimes. And also let me remind you, the UN Human Rights Commission was very clear in opposing Armed Forces Special Powers Act that said uh, and I quote them, that it's a uh, quote, a symbol of excessive state power, unquote. This is what the UNHRC had said and, rec and uh, requested the government of India repeatedly to review Armed Forces Special Powers Act. We know that the second administrative reform committee had also said that Armed Forces Special Powers Act ought to be revoked. We also know that uh, Jeevan Reddy Committee had asked for repeal of Armed Forces Special Powers Act. The point I'm trying to make is here is considered weighty, well-reasoned arguments that have been put forward, a variety of institutions, international and, and domestic, which have all had something critical to say about Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Mm. Yet, the government rejecting that comes down to, to insist that even registration of an FIR means. requires sanction of the central government means that all avenues for the civilians are going to be shut. In the name of what? In the name of national interest, uh, fighting terrorists and things like that. This is a good way of avoiding looking into and critically examining our own role government's own role, our own government's role into the making of the conflict that Jammu and Kashmir is mm. and for making it worse than what it, it, what it is. Um, it is also a way in which you ensure that there is no record, even through complaints, you see, recording of an FIR is not the end of the road yeah. because it doesn't mean that it results in conviction. It yeah, doesn't even that. mean that there will be any prosecution yeah, as we that. all know. There have been and 50 the, uh, requests made by the uh, in cases where FIRs have been registered for, uh, for pr proceedings to take place. So the op opposing it is also because please remember that there is no statute of limitation for war crimes. Mm -hmm. As a result, if there is any written complaint and FIR constitutes mm -hmm. a written complaint that has been registered is something that the uh, armed forces personnel are scared of mm -hmm. because they don't want any trail, any leads because investigation can be opened up after 20 years, 25 years. Yeah. And uh, perpetrators can be brought to justice at that point. So they want to erase, they want to ensure that there are no records per se mm. of anything. It is this that makes it extremely dangerous. Mm. Because what you're saying is that the army has therefore, uh, or the armed forces have not only enjoy legal immunity, they have a free hand in doing whatever they want to. And a spate of killings, increase in the number of killings of civilians, uh, points in the direction 
that this seems to be the purpose behind Operation All Out, which, is, uh, which began last year in May, uh, with much fanfare. Uh, and this links up to something that I'd like to, uh, to point out, is that if you remember last year, Army Chief had said, in the context of uh, expressing his concern about the situation in Jammu and Kashmir, he had said something which I'd like to quote. Quote, as we are conducting operations against militants, we find that the local population is somehow not supportive of the actions of the security forces, unquote. Now, it's an he pointed out at something which is actually the actual ground situation in Jammu and Kashmir. The issue is that the people are opposed. They are not supporting army operations, which means that all these operations are taking place in the midst of strong and popular opposition of the civilian population of Jammu and of, of Kashmir in particular. Uh, instead of heeding this and learning the lessons or actually inferring the proper lessons from this situation that exists on the ground, if you use it to say, well, we will impose our will and extract acquiescence or submission of the people so that they accept mm -hmm. and support us, I think it just tells you that the Indian Republic as we, all of us imagine or have been taught to imagine mm -hmm. uh, as a democratic constitutional republic is actually being, being, we are being told that that's not to be. And it's this which is scary. Okay, so that's all the time we have for today, Gautam. Thank you for joining us in this discussion. And uh, thank, thank you. you thank you for watching this click.